Death Jula Jane here. I'm doing my very first video. I actually am going to do that. Um, I get asked a lot to go out for coffee and talk about what it means to be an end of a life doula. How do you get there? What does the work look like in real life? So I'm doing this video in an effort to answer some of those questions without driving around like a mad woman or spending a lot of time on email. So here's my cup of coffee. Get your cup of coffee and I'm just gonna answer questions that people have asked me in the past. So, what is a death doula? A death doula is a non-medical person who provides spiritual, emotional, and physical support to dying people and their caregivers. And that's the generic answer. What I would say is a death doula, number one, first and foremost, is someone who is really comfortable with their own mortality. They probably have a daily practice where they are thinking about dying, that life is short, that um, you really want to live your values. That's the most important thing. They're not afraid to talk about death. They're not afraid to be with people who are dying. And you, you don't start out that way, right? Um, you get there through experience and making a lot of mistakes. I have made a lot of mistakes. So I always say like I have a job where I step on landmines and that's the only way I learn. And we just have to be humble and apologetic when we mess up. So the other thing a death doula really needs is to be able to listen without needing to fix the person. Or problems because death is something we can't fix so the people that we are with are struggling with some mighty big things anger uh, resentment uh, grief really profound human emotion and we have to be able to just listen what I always say is tell me more and not speak in those silences where they are thinking because that's where the real work of dying happens is being able to think about this stuff. And so we're just there as a witness and a, and a very light sounding board with family and caregivers. Our primary job is to hold space. So we create, that's a kind of new age term that can be somehow not super concrete, but what it really means is to create a pause in people's lives. So say someone is dying at the hospital, it's unexpected, all the family members are there, the person dies, there's severe sadness. What a death doula can do, and ideally you're doing work upstream, but what you can do is assemble the family members and be calm and loving and give them some options about how they can mark this time. Say for example, like let's get some flowers and put them around your person and let's, um, you know, I have blessings and poems that I have memorized that I can just assemble. We can hold hands. Just very simple rituals. You are creating a pause in this really hectic, chaotic, crazy time to connect them to what is happening. And that's really hard to do when you are one of the people who is experiencing a profound loss. So that is my nutshell. What is a death doula? How do you prepare yourself to be one? I think... People's first question frequently out of the gate is what training should I do? And I, I really seriously believe what training you should do should not be the first question you ask yourself. It should be like weighed into this experience. Like when friends get hospice, volunteer at hospice. You do not have to say you're an end of life doula or do doula work. Just do normal, regular volunteer work, hospice, be with death, see if that's right for you. Most people come to this question of, I want to be a death doula because they were with someone who died in their family and they could feel, feel that connection that they were, that peace that they were able to bring to the situation or the instincts about what to do in certain situations. So volunteer at hospice, that's number one. Get involved with friends and family, start reading about death and dying. Bef you know, take a class befriending death or some kind of death meditation. So just further your own work on your own self. I would say that is number one. Um, at this point, there is no national accreditation. So there's no, you're not going to be able to get a job because you have this training. Um, so for that reason, I'm just a little cautious about trainings. 
I feel like there are is a huge balloon of end of life doulas and no work. To tell you the honest, total truth, I have zero clients right now. Um, and I don't have a ton of clients. I, I clean houses, I do astrological charts, and I'm a death educator. And I'm just, you know, I'm part of the gig economy, just kind of going from day to day. So don't let anyone tell you that you can quit your full-time job to do this work. Because right now, that does not exist. And one day, maybe it will, and we're going to get paid. This is my projection into the future. I think we're going to get paid about the same as home health aides. I mean, may, maybe more. I don't know. But I am leery about training programs that tell you that you can make a living at this. Or, or else I'm doing something wildly wrong because I am not making a living at it. Um, NIDA, the National End of, Duel, End of Life Doula Alliance, is a great place to start. Um, basically all the heavy hitters in the major program training programs who are really smart, wise people. I do not mean to say anything about that. They are pushing this movement forward in a very thoughtful, careful way. And the website is an awesome resource for people who are interested in doing this work. So NIDA, and they are really working at trying to provide not an accreditation, but basically a test that you take that, and you do not have to do a training to take this test. You can come to it from life experience and um, it will prove that you have these core competencies. So the dream is that hospice will recognize this need a badge that you've passed this test and feel more confident and comfortable in engaging you um, as a worker or volunteer. Um, that is in the process of happening. I would not say that we're there yet. Um, so another thing people ask is how do I get clients? I get clients through word of mouth because I do a lot of death educating. Um, the way that happened is I became an end of life doula. I did a training and then I put up my website and I thought I was done. And of course no one ever called me because no one wants to think about death. They certainly don't want to plan for it. Even if they have a terminal diagnosis, they don't want to go into hospice. So no one's going to call it an end of life doula. Um, so frequently I get called when people have like two hours left to live or they call me frantic from the hospital and there's not a lot I can do. I mean, I can offer, how do you create a space and here's some blessing and poems and make sure you drink water and get out under the sky and these basic like survival tips, but that's not really doula work, um, or certainly not utilizing a doula as much as possible. So I think... I don't know how to answer that. How do I get clients? Because otherwise I would have clients. Um, get started with friends and family. There are, when you start telling people that you are an end of life doula and you want to help out, friends and family will tell their friends and family. Uh, so when pe someone is dying in the greater community, they will contact you. And frequently it is volunteer work. Um, what does an average experience look like with a client that is really wildly varied because of when people get engaged with you? My ideal experience is someone got a terminal diagnosis and then they contact me right away and then I tell them to get a palliative care consult because they need to have these two tracks. So they need to have modern medicine, regular oncologists or whoever it is who focus on quantity and then they need a palliative care doc team who will help them focus on quality. Even that consult, I think they can get a lot of ground on what matters, what am I living for, what quality of life am I shooting for, and if I can't get there, you know, do I want to keep getting... This is a perfect example. I had a guy that I was volunteering at hospice, and I met a man who was dying. He probably had seven to ten days left to live. And he was really bitter because he had done this last chemotherapy that didn't work, but it destroyed his taste buds and left him with sores in his mouth so he can't eat. And he is so bitter. He's like, eating is my greatest joy. And here I am in the last time of my life and I can't eat anything. I feel like the time that I have left has been destroyed. And I'm not sure if that was pointed out to him Um I mean, maybe it's like, oh, a side effect could be that you have sores in your mouth. But um, 
People need to know the real consequences of it. If it's your last two weeks or month, do you want to have these painful sores? How realistic is, are we going to be able to buy time with this treatment? Um, so I, get, I like to get involved early on and uh, I'll take one client, for example, um, was in her forties, had a couple of kids. Um, and she, I think we were together for 18 months. So she got in touch with me right away. She actually, she had pancreatic cancer. So she outlived her, di her prognosis um, by an additional year. And we got to work through her grief at not being able to parent her kids. Um, we do projects around that. We did grief about leaving her husband and, and concerns about like, is he going to be able to handle this? Like parenting two kids by himself. And then she was like, wait, where am I in all this? Like, what's my experiences? I'm worried about all these other people, but what, what about me? So then we focused a lot on her and we, you know, I would suggest readings or activities to do or just talking. Um, and then as time went on, we really prepared her deathbed, what she wanted it to look like. She got special fancy sheets and curtains and she put up her artwork that she loved and that inspired her and her poems and blessings that she loved. And she made this beautiful sunroom and um, bought special lotion that smelled good to her and got had friends buy candles because she loves beeswax and <clears throat> really set herself up for physical comfort and it really her care team knew exactly what she wanted to feel good fresh flowers special tea that kind of thing um and then as time goes on and the person you know she became less actually she declined very quickly so that happened very so fast but then i switched to helping the caregivers and supporting them and grounding them and creating space for them and ideas for rituals um, frequently a family wants to do after death body care and to be clear, the state of Minnesota, it is illegal for a person who is not a funeral director to get paid for touching a dead body. So what I do, and this is appropriate for every doula, it's not your grief. It's not your loved one. Oops. <clears throat> it's not your loved one. So the, you shouldn't be involved. You are coaching, you are guiding from behind. You are telling them how to do this time old, old ritual of caring for our dead. That is so good for our own grief. Um, so, and then I do, I'm a bereavement. Um, I am a grief companion. So I'm not a therapist, I'm not a counselor, but I had, I am now what I had that was super helpful. So when Rob was sick, I worked at Ikea and one of my coworkers, who I didn't know super well, but I, I liked her. She came up to me and grabbed my hand. She said, I heard your husband is really sick. Here's my card. Here are all my numbers. My husband died a year ago. Like I will be, you know, at your side, call me. So I put it away and after he died, maybe... It might have almost have been like six months. I called her and we just would have coffee every couple months. And I'd say, this is what's going on. Like, I can't go to the grocery store. I'm afraid to see people who don't know that he's died. Um, I'm exhausted all the time. And she would normalize my experience. Like, yep, yep, that's how I felt. And I had a lot of regret and I was replaying his death. And I kept, you know, every time I closed my eyes, I could see his face when he was already dead, which was upsetting to me. And... She would say that's not going to last forever. Like that lasted for me for three or four months. Totally normal. Or the, and then she told me the first year is really hard. You're in shock and you can basically do nothing. You're exhausted. And the second year is actually harder because you have to put your, you have to create this new identity separate from this person. And you never wanted to do that in the first place. So that's exhausting. And it was just super helpful for me to know that. So for my clients, I frequently do it on the phone. We just call each other. Um, and I normalize their experience and I listen to them and, um, caregivers, oops, that's the neighborhood caregivers frequently put on this armor to get through what they have to get through. 
And if it has been a long time where someone has been caring for this person multiple years, it is really hard for those caregivers to take that armor off. So I frequently suggest people to go to a, ther a grief therapist or you know get help on a professional level if it feels like it's beyond my scope. But many times just telling people, you, know, you gotta find a way to nurture that grief. You know, because you can just soldier on and, and do your regular life, but you, that part of you is, is stuck in there. And you got to find some way to access that super sad part of you so that it can start to change. Because grief is transformational. I truly believe that. Um, so how do I take care of myself? This is a frequent question. Like, oh, it must be so sad, you know. Um, what do you, how do you do this? It must be so hard. And I have uh, found, and this might change uh, the more, the deeper I get into this work, but I have found actually that it just makes me really grateful. I am grateful to have known these people. I am grateful that I can eat food, that I can walk, that I can talk. Uh, I am, I am really grateful that I can hug my kids. Um, it changes your whole attitude about life. So really being able to work with people who are so close to the end of this life is a is a gift that I am so grateful for and I accept it humbly. And if, if I'm really feeling like twisted by a certain situation or dynamic, you know, I feel like nature is always our companion, always available to us. Get out alone in nature under the big bright sky and that can usually make me right. What's my advice on how to get started? I'm gonna show you all my, my books. Um, my first favorite book, Duck, Death, and Tulip. Oh my gosh, it's a children's book about death and it is just the sweetest. I mean, that might not look sweet, but if you read this book, you will see that it is sweet. And I'm not sure that I read that to children um, someone asked BJ Miller once, what's the best book, uh, that you would recommend for people who are dying? And he's thought for a while and he said, I think children's books or maybe big, huge picture books of like art, you know, uh, which I just thought was interesting. I do find that people want to be read to from books that are, I've read Snow White to people. Uh, I have read Harry Potter. I have read, you know, some children's books from the thirties that I've never seen before. Um, there's something about going back in your life, maybe back to childhood or back to a time when you were happy and it's really comforting. So, um, there, this is like my number one, a beginner's guide to the end in my birth death analogy talks. I frequently say, you know, why don't we have a, what to expect when you're expecting book? So we, people, we can prepare for this experience called death. Well, BJ Miller and Shoshana Berger wrote Beginner's Guide to the End. Awesome manual. It's not, uh, it's just an awesome manual. If you are facing this experience, you want that book. Um, this is my next favorite. The Five Invitations, Frank Ostaseski. Uh, what death teaches us about living. This is like, a key, I think, to becoming a doula is understanding these principles and living these principles. Um, Being with Dying by Joan Halifax. She is my jam. She is the one who says, we need to think about the death we're afraid of and we need to picture it and we need to write it down and we need to be there and live it and absorb that experience. And then we need to think about the death that we want and picture that and live it and write it down. And then we need to ask ourselves, what are we willing to give up to get the death we want? Because right now we don't give up much. We ride that, that train of treatments right on into, you know, the ICU at the hospital and, and then it's over. And we miss out on the opportunity that death gives us to be a meaning culmination of our life, to be our most vulnerable, loving, forgiving, um, accepting people with each other. I think it's our, it, I think it can be us at our best selves. It can be us not at our best selves too. It's all about your intention and what your desire. 
but I personally want to be, I, I frequently tell clients, think about your deathbed and how you want to feel on that. How does your body want to feel? How does your heart want to feel? How does your mind want to feel? And then you need to do that work upstream so that when you get to your deathbed, you are peaceful and calm and loving in all those areas. And if you have anxiety about death, your mind is going to be racing, then you need to start working on that now. And I guarantee you, you will have a better life. Um, how does your heart want to feel? What are the relationships that don't feel right for you? That there's some kind of, there's a, a, a grit there that you got to work out. We'll do that now. So that I've seen so many families just have a really hard time with death because all this stuff backs up on them. Um, and then how do you want to feel in your body? How do you want to be comforted? Um, like my the client I told you about, physically, what do you, how physically, do you want someone baking cookies so you can smell cookies in your house? Or do you want like pot roast? Or do you want like doll? I don't know. Um, and then I love this, Barbaneric Natural Causes, because it talks a lot about you know, we, we, the medical team, senior assisted living places can keep us alive a very long time. I see my parents in their very fancy senior living place and uh, they've gone from the independent living and down into the place where it's, you know, they have a nurse on staff all the time and doors are locked and um, they're surrounded by people in wheelchairs who can no longer move themselves and they can't talk and I they can't respond. Um, and they have special wheelchairs because they have to have padded because they can't move their limbs. And I just think, should, I mean, I myself personally, I, I don't want to live like that. If I have Alzheimer's, I want to think ahead about that experience and I want to have some sort of agency about what happens to me. Um, I think that's what it all boils down to. So Barbara and Erin Hike is, she has, is a breast cancer survivor. And at 75, she said, I'm not going to take tamoxifen or any other meds anymore. And that's radical. And I realize that, but she's like, I just want to die from natural causes. Whatever is coming, uh, that's what I want to die from. I don't want to be kept alive that long. And it's a personal decision and I pass no judgment Nobody gets to pass judgment on what each individual wants for the end of their life. But I think people need to think about it. Because if you don't think about it, if I don't plan for it, I could end up being one of those people in the wheelchair who is trapped in this body and this mind. And I know I don't want that for myself. So I am thinking ahead about, you know, how to get the death I want and what I'm willing to give up to get it. Uh, these are sort of the old Atul Gawande. I'm sure everybody's already read this. It's amazing. Um, he was kind of the first one out of the gate for, you know, how we treat seniors and how do we age and what values are we following. It's really great. When Breath Becomes Heir, Paul Kalanithi. Uh, also really great and probably you've all read it. This might be a little more of a sleeper. Living Consciously, Dying Gracefully. It's by two hospice nurses, and it's really awesome. And this might be regional. I don't know if these folks are from the Twin Cities. It's um, Nancy Monahan and Becky Bohan. When I go to hospice, Mary Oliver is my constant companion. When I'm a volunteer, I frequently read poems with people when they are alert and when they are no longer alert. She has all these amazing, beautiful poems about nature. And who wouldn't want to be transported to nature? Uh, and then, of course, Walking Each Other Home by Ram Dass. This is not my, this is not like a really rock star book, but Ram Dass is rock star. So if you're in this field, you will want to know about him. He just passed away a couple months ago. I just said passed away. He just died a couple months ago. Um... But Ram Das means servant of God. And I, this is a great place to end because an end of life doula, I think, well, actually all the living sentient beings, I think at your highest purpose, you are a servant to whatever God you believe in. And even if you don't believe in a God, you are 
Well, I guess I don't know. Do I know the answer to that question? I might not. And I tend to get on a soapbox, so I'm just going to just step down. Um, but for myself, it is a very good analogy. It's not about me. When I am with people, I am completely empty, and some kind of love from source comes through me, and every end-of-life doula will tell you that. So, um, and I think that, someone asked me the question, how do you know when you're an end-of-life doula? Because, you know, you take a training and you don't feel ready. So how do you know? What's the moment? I think that's the moment. When you feel some kind of love coming through you, that is not, you know it's not yours. And it's, I fall in love with people all the time at hospice. I just fall madly in love with them. Like, people are beautiful in all their ornery, complicated beautifulness. And um, that is... That's why I'm an end-of-life doula. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Mwah.